Hello, and welcome back to another analysis with Joe Sandbox Cloud Basic. In today's video, we'll be using an unknown adware sample and taking a greater look at what it is, its characteristics, and how it behaves. So firstly, I'll upload the sample into Joe Sandbox. I'll choose the system of the virtual machine we want to use. For this, I'll choose Windows 10. I'll select a live interaction and generate a deep analysis report. And after agreeing to their terms and conditions, I'll begin the analysis. I'll cut right back after it's finished setting up the live interaction. So we can see here, our adware has executed this display for us. If I go ahead and select this green button, it takes us to this website where it looks to be showing us some sort of discounts and percentages. I go back to the executable, click it again, can select the website, and then there's a button for me to select at the bottom, some sort of file, which downloads an unwanted file. Once Joe Sandbox has finished analyzing the malware, we can open up its full report. If we scroll down, we can see the process tree listed below. We can see that the adware performs a number of sophisticated techniques. Some of these include network activity, in that the system processes connects to external networks. There's evidence of persistence and installation. It drops a number of files into the Joe Sandbox virtual machine, it performs numerous attempts at system evasion, and attempts to detect any antivirus on the system, and it also injects code and exploits system modes. Some basic detections from Avira show us that it detected some dropped files and gave them a malicious score from reversing labs. These were LDS Game Hall, basic.tpi, LDS basic.dll, and rundl.exe. The adware also abuses system processes, such as service host, to connect to various networks. This is likely due to a code injection exploit. The IP addresses seen in connection with other malware are 192.229.221.95 on port 80 and also 152.199.19.74. The report later on highlights that several system processes initiated network connections and these are likely due to code injection or exploitation. This is typically a sign of malware attempting to communicate with a command and control server, exfiltrate data or download additional payloads. SVC host is a legitimate Windows process which is often hijacked by malware. The persistence and installation behavior of the adware shows that it installs new root certificates, as shown here in the registry keys. And this is a technique used to intercept or tamper with secure connections. We can see under the phishing section that a HTML page is missing a favicon, and it's the page that we are redirected to when interacting in the test environment. If a website is missing a favicon, it is known to be associated with spyware or malicious activity. And a few flags that may raise this is the lack of professionalism. Legitimate websites typically have favicons as part of their branding, and a missing favicon can be a sign of a hastily put together site, which may indicate malicious intent. Some phishing sites may mimic legitimate ones, but lack common features, including a favicon. And a favicon can also contribute to the overall trustworthiness of a site. If this is missing, it should raise the user's suspicions, especially if the site has a negative reputation. Here we can see behavior of the spyware searching for available system drives in an attempt to spread itself out into as many different areas of the device as possible. If we investigate the tries to load missing DLLs, we can see by scrolling down the ungodly amount that the adware tries to load. The suspicious nature of this is that it makes it unnecessarily complex. Legitimate software usually relies on a manageable number of DLLs that are essential for its function. Loading an excessive number may indicate that the software is doing more than it needs to. Malware can also use many DLLs to hide its true intentions and obfuscate them. By distributing its code across multiple libraries, it can make detection and analysis more difficult for the security software. Loading a large amount of DLLs, as shown in the report, can also strain system resources, which leads to slower performance. Often, adware aims to hijack system resources for its own benefit, such as serving ads or tracking user behavior. Some malicious programs use DLLs to establish persistence on a system. This makes it harder to remove. They may use DLLs to evade detection by security software. And then not all of these DLLs are from trusted sources or are digitally unsigned, and this raises the risk that they can contain harmful code or a part of a malicious payload. Opening up the Windows shortcut file LNK, 
contains relative path shows a number of different links or shortcuts that points to a Chrome proxy executable. This redirection is malicious and highly suspicious. Malicious actors may use YouTube or Google Drive or other social platforms to distribute malware and disguise the link to make it appear like it leads to a legitimate video or resource, but actually trick the users into downloading an executable file. The Chrome proxy executable might claim to be related to Google Chrome, which is a trusted browser, but is most likely malware designed to hijack system functions, steal data, and provide remote access to the attackers. And this is a form of social engineering. Opening the disables application error messages, we can see that the adware sets a lot of different applications to suppress error messages that could reveal its activities or hinder its execution. The no open file error box is a flag that instructs Windows not to display error messages when certain systems call. This can improve the malware's stealth, avoid debugging or analysis detection, and prevent interruption of automated malware processes. A practical example of this is that if a malware sample tried to load a malicious DLL or drop a file into, into a protected directory, it may set the no open file error box to suppress any failure message if it cannot access the target file or location. Instead of the system showing a pop-up that could prompt the user to investigate, the operation fails silently and the malware can try another technique or file. Under the malware analysis system evasion, if we open the tries to detect sandboxes and other dynamic analysis tools, we can see that it actively searches and hunts for a virtual machine and sandbox environments. Because the malware is actively checking for any sandbox environment, it does this by stopping execution if it detects that it is being analyzed. And this is a common evasion technique. We can see here the malware uses sleep loops to make it harder for the analysis tools to detect its behavior. And it does this by delaying activity until the tool times out. The adware also creates a process in suspended mode. We can see that it frequently creates suspended processes, a common technique used to inject malicious code into legitimate processes. It also modifies the prologue of the user's mode functions. We can see the malware modifies low-level functions to intercept or alter the behavior of legitimate system processes, thus allowing it to hide its activities. Another dead giveaway when looking through this report is that we can see that the adware attempts to make changes to the system's antivirus. The adware uses Windows Management Instrumentation, or WMI, to detect security software, allowing it to evade or disable protections. AV also processes strings found. These strings indicate that the malware has functions that are often used to terminate antivirus processes. We can see from the MITRE attack matrix that Joe Sandbox has created, the adware exhibits a lot of techniques. To break this down further, under initial access, the malware likely gains initial access into the system through phishing or by being dropped as part of a larger malicious package. And this is indicated by its classification earlier on in the report as a part of phishing and botnet categories. For its execution techniques, the malware executes various payloads on the system, and these are including PE files and DLLs. The malware also ensures persistence by modifying Windows services and dropping files into the system directories, such as the previously covered program data directory and also the Windows Start menu directory. It attempts to escalate its privileges by loading many DLL files. It also abuses Windows services. It edits registry keys and enables debug privileges. The adware is very sophisticated in its defense evasion and tries to detect sandboxes and dynamic analysis tools. It does this by allocating memory with a right watch and then performs evasive loops to avoid detection. The malware shows discovery techniques by querying disk information and volume information. This is likely done as part of its efforts to detect virtual environments and to gather system information. Joe Sandbox also gives us a very complex behavior graph of the adware. Some of the more important parts of this behavior graph is that we can see it attempting to use Windows services to contact its command and control servers and this is done to either exfiltrate data or download additional payloads. The original adware also installs this executable here. This drops a number of further applications onto the system. The game download application 
then attempts to connect to two different IP addresses in China and drop further malicious DOLs. The LDS Game Master application installs new root certificates, tries to detect sandboxes and other dynamic analysis tools. For the initial sample, Reversing Labs has labelled the adware as a Windows 32 generic Trojan. On the other hand, Avira has labelled it as a TR ATRAPS gen. The TR prefix typically stands for Trojan. The ATRAPS is often a reference to the specific family or category of Trojans. ATRAPS is a family of Trojans known for various malicious activities, which include backdoor functions that allow remote attackers to control the infected system and information stealing capabilities. And finally, the .gen suffix usually indicates that the detection is a generic or heuristic detection. The report highlights that several system processes initiated network connections, likely due to code injection or exploitation. As previously mentioned, this is typically a sign of the adware attempting to communicate with a command and control server. Some of the IP addresses, such as these ones flagged as malicious, that connect to Edgecast, are commonly used by legitimate services, but their involvement here might indicate that the malware leverages these networks to mask malicious activity within normal internet traffic. Today, we looked at an adware sample analyzed by Joe's Sandbox Cloud Basic. The file had been assigned a detection score of 100, and some of the characteristics of this sample included that it tried to connect to various IP addresses located in China, Japan, and the US. And these suspicious connections and communications suggest data exfiltration or command and control activities. The malware has a significant impact to the system as well. It modifies critical parts of the system, such as security settings, root certificates and services, and loads a number of DLL files, which chew up system resources. It also has a number of advanced evasion techniques, including sandbox detection, sleeping to avoid analysis, and modifying user mode functions. It also allocates memory in a way that suggests an attempt to bypass the analysis. Thank you for watching this video.